Hey there, welcome to SaaS Unbound, brought to you by SaaS Group. I'm your host, Anna Dana, and this is the show where we chat with inspiring founders and experts to get an inside scoop on how they made their business success. And today with me is Charles Miglietti, CEO and co-founder of Tukan Toko, a um, SaaS business management platform that simplifies the process of data analysis and visualization. He advocates for driving productivity through data to build products effectively. And I'm really excited to learn how exactly you're doing this. So happy to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. All right. Well, it's so great that you've seen founder of Bcast, one of the founders, one of the companies that we have recently acquired, have introduced us. Let's maybe start with your background. How did you end up in SaaS and building Tukun in the first place? Yeah. So um, Tukun was not my first, but my second company. And I have a background in engineer, I was passionate about data, visualization, design, and pedagogy. And that's how I started Tukan nearly 10 years ago. Our mission, which is was and still is, to bring data in the hands of as many people as possible to make data uh, actionable, to make data usable. And today uh, we focus on customer facing analytics. So it means that we provide uh, independent software vendors with the best solution to integrate within their product to build their own X offering. So that's what we do today. So yeah, it's been nearly 10 years. Uh, at the beginning, we bootstrapped the business for the first four or five years, and we raised a series A with Balloton Capital uh, four years ago. Right. Okay. Well, uh, that's quite a journey already. But how did the inspiration for the product came to you? Like, yeah, sure, there, there is passion for, for data, there is passion for design. How do you pair that and, uh, you know, realize that there is actually a problem to be solved and this is the product that a lot of people want, not just, not just you? Yeah, and so with my uh, co-founder at that time, uh, Kilian, we uh, realized that all the data products were built for technical users. They were like basically excels on steroids uh, uh, so very uh, hard to use hard to learn hard to master uh, and our conviction is that uh, it should be what we sell what we say convention over configuration and that um, those data product should be as easy to use as a b2c application so this is that was our starting point, how we can not I would say, take the opposite, but at least take another angle from the data product and try to design the interface, the UX, the workflows, uh, so that uh, my mother or, or somebody that's purely non-technical can uh, make the most out of it. So yeah, that was our, our, our starting point. Uh, really create adoption, can usage, um, and at the end, bring the value that the data can bring in the hands of as much people as possible. Okay, sounds good. You're not the first founder that says we tested on my mom, <laughs> and if she if she understood, it's good enough for our for our customers. So that's perfect. Great, great strategy. So you started as a bootstrap company. Let's cover that period, maybe. So as a bootstrap company doing data visualization, doing business intelligence, how did you get to your first customers? Because this is not in the easiest niche to operate in as is. And as a, a small early stage bootstrap company, I imagine you've had some challenges. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the first client, so during well, when we were bootstrap during the, at least the first two years, we uh, managed to balance between building the product, building the SaaS product we wanted to sell, and also operating some services to serve uh, customers that were in need of more data visualization more broadly. So our first customers were customers that wanted to uh, make some nice and good looking data visualization and we managed to find them and to sign them based on i would say local meetings close relationship friend of friends networks at the end that's a very patent need and very all organizations at some point have this need of 
communicating the data, uh, uh, making sense of the data, uh, creating good stories based on the data. So pitch was, it was very easy with our pitch to get in touch in the first meetings with many people. So, and at the end, we managed to, to sign a good amount of business uh, the, from, I would say, the first year. And we grew year over year. And at some point also, it on to a pure size business in 2016. Okay, sounds good. Yesterday we had an AMA with the VP of Marketing of Chartmogul, and this is what we talked about. Like there are so many free opportunities for for booster founders to go out there and find customers and engage with the audience, and this is exactly what you're talking about. So, how did you navigate? your roadmap at this early stage because you already said that it wasn't your first business but how much did you know already about data visualization and data storytelling by the way when i read data storytelling i was like okay that's very interesting you paired something so kind of boring <laughs> with something that is so hype and so important for businesses and you made it work. So uh, I really want to get deeper into that, but let's first talk about uh, the strategies that you use for your roadmap. Yeah, so for the roadmap, what we used at the, at the beginning uh, was very, in some sense, easy <laughs> in the sense that we went after a very small set of clients and we focus all those clients to very specific needs, which was uh, what specific need, which is how they can make like a very dynamic, beautiful, good looking and interactive. So how we prioritize, we use like classical, like rice methodologies where we have like many, I would say initiative feature, features we request, and then try to maximize the reach, the impact, while also ensuring that we have like a good estimate, good confidence on, on the on those initiatives. We conducted also a few for any features, uh, a good amount of user testing. Uh, and our goal was also to be very close to our client where when we will be releasing something. So all that we dev everything that we developed, we wanted to make sure that it had all our clients would benefit from that. Okay. And I cannot not notice that you're all, all, always saying how beautiful the product and how beautiful the data visualization was supposed to be. And that was kind of the core of the product. This is what you wanted to yeah. differentiate yourself with, like yeah. design. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, there is a, a heavy focus since the beginning on UI and UX. I would say I would call it the sexiness of the data because yeah uh, like you mentioned merging like data and starting like boring concepts with something uh, fancy and interesting yeah very important when you say okay i want to re-enchant make it uh, fun make it entertaining in some sense the data you have to do something because you, you come from a long way where people are used to dull interface very complex very not buggy but very like yeah cumbersome interfaces and mm -hmm. uh, it was and it's still one of the most important uh driver uh to deliver something that when somebody is looking at it they say wow that's really really different uh, uh, than what i y used to see yeah for us that's clearly a differentiator Right. Well, and I have to say, when I went to the website to like research about what you're doing, what you put out there, I was like, okay, wow, this is not your usual data kind of product. It's really pretty. So <laughs> great design. I have to give you that. Thank you. All right. Well, something else that I noticed on the website is just the amount of information that you're sharing as just the sophistication of everything you put in your blog, just step-by-step, step, everything that you put out about the product, about the new features, about the case-by-case -case scenarios. How did you come up with that? Was it your strategy from the very beginning to educate your customers, to work on your SEO and on your content marketing, or that came after you raised the money? Since the not the beginning, but after a few years, when you, I would say when your product is in some sense ready 
uh, and you know who you want to go after and you have like a clear messaging, a clear positioning. Yeah, we, we started to invest in uh, our website, in our content marketing to make sure we educate our leads as much as possible. So it's not an overnight project. Uh, it's the results of many years of work that you, what you see here, even if like uh, often you need to revamp, readapt, uh, rewrite and, and adjust what you've done. But uh, yeah, I would say it's not after we raised the money that we decided to invest in content marketing. Uh, we uh, used to do that before because content marketing, your website being clear about your value proposition, it's uh, mandatory for me uh, for any uh, acquisition uh, strategy. And as our strategy relied half on inbound and half on outbound, yeah, it's important to have like a, a, a very strong website with like good copywriting and also differentiated copywriting because uh, uh, you are in an industry where in a space where uh, there are uh, lots of noise and lots of uh, um, alternatives or lots of products and you need to stand out and you need to your prospects and the people that are evaluating you need to understand how you're different how you will uh, uh, serve them yeah, differently and better than the others okay yeah that makes sense all right so since we started talking about growth and well, you're serving your clients with providing them better ways to visualize the data and analyze the data. What for you were the success metrics and the data that you were tracking from the very beginning to analyze your growth? And did you use Tukan to do that? So we, we used Tukan since a few years only, I would say. Uh, yeah, during yeah, we start to use Tukan since in, just before we raised the Series A. For me, it was important to when we were doing our Series A funding to show that we were our own users of the platform. Uh, so the data we track, I would say, for me, it's like very classical data that any SaaS business is tracking: our growth, gross margin, and but also uh, CAC, LTV. So all those. Uh, we say the classical SaaS uh, KPIs. The basics. Yeah. Yeah. All right. How, in in your personal opinion, or what served you well, uh, how do you think businesses can better understand what KPIs are important for them, especially at the early stages? Because at the early stages, you kind of want to do everything. You want to try everything. And... Uh, analyze everything at the same time so how to focus and how to really understand yeah. what are the important kpis to track and what is there for you yeah that that's a very good question and i, I can say that there is no one answer because what you describe here for me it's the work of the leadership team uh, to mm -hmm. assess at a given point in time what's the best KPI to follow to that are in line with the strategy and that are the best to follow to make sure that we go to the next step. So depending on your stage, depending on where you come from, where you want to, where you're heading, very, for me, very, very different. So the, what's very important in what you said is focus because you can do it all and you can be maximizing and optimizing all KPIs on 10 uh, lever. So yeah. you need to choose one, two, three. Uh, and this is what we did uh, uh, in the company since the beginning as we introduced very early on the OKR methodology and trying to set clear overall metrics like no star metrics not in the product in the company that we would follow and like i said it could be like very simple metrics like at the beginning the growth or the margin but uh, after it can be more like are oh, you looking at your win rate for specific use case or your conversion rates in some part of the funnels depending on what you want to ass assess what you want to improve what you want to act on you need to determine the, the right metrics that will be like a good proxy to measure uh, success or failure but you can't be on all fronts at the same time okay thank you i think that's a great answer focus is very important and uh, yeah no matter how much you want to test and iterate at the early stages i would say that early on in the process in the in the 
life of a, of a startup. I think the most important metrics I will be looking for are more the one in terms that, that uh, show there is a good echo of the messaging and the positioning on the market for the leads and the prospects. So I'm very, I will be very, uh, uh, I'll be looking at like all the leads and lead conversion metrics because this is where it starts. It starts, do you have a, a good messaging, a good positioning, and also like something that really respond to a need. So I wouldn't at the beginning focus on, for example, on growth or on more like bottom lines of the PLs before you are sure that what you want to do, what you are building really solves a, a need for a specific niche. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely gets more complicated the more uh, a company grows. So let's get there. At a certain point, you decided that you needed to scale. And for that reason, you raised $12 million. So started rapidly scaling. As far as I understood from what I read in your blog, uh, you hired more than 100 people all over the globe which is a lot. Uh, we, we're also growing really, really fast at SaaS Group and it's a bit of a challenge to integrate everybody and to make sure, you know, the culture is aligned and everyone is on the same page. So how did it go for you? Why did you decide in the first place that you wanted that rapid growth and how did it affect the company, the culture and the people that were already there? Yeah, that's a good question. So we decided to take that route because uh, I would say it was for us a will. We wanted to follow that path of the yeah, series A and have like a, a knowledgeable people that could help us in the journey. So very important. It was very important for us to be backed by uh, entrepreneurs, by uh, professionals that will help us scale and scale quickly. Uh, also, uh, it's uh, a market where, <laughs> in some sense, you need funding to grow faster and to take the market shares that otherwise go to the competitors. And and, and also for us, it was exciting to I'd say, get more money budget for our uh, project. So when you are bootstrapped, you are usually very limited in terms of the investment you can make. And to be successful at some point, uh, you need to make some significant in investment in some part of your company, and it takes some time to to get the payback. So, yeah. Right, absolutely. So why did you decide that, I guess, the biggest allocation of the funds was going to go to hiring? And what did it mean for the culture of the company and the people that were there yeah. from the beginning? Yeah, so... At, at our size, I would say it's the, the money you raise is mostly for hiring because we don't have like lots of cogs. We have a, a very high cost margin. So the thing we need to, where we invest is mostly people and you need to invest in people to accelerate your roadmap in the product, to accelerate your go-to-market strategy. So that's why you, yeah, most of the budget goes to hiring. And in terms of culture and people, where uh, I'm very proud and this is the work that we've done very early on in the company is to define a very strong core set of core values and company culture. So we did that when we were only like five or six in the company. And as we hired more and more and more in scale, we were very, very diligent to make sure that anybody that is joining the company reflects the culture, embody the culture. Uh, so I would say making sure that uh, the hiring doesn't break your culture or your values was part of the of the process because we very early on we invested in that. Uh, so I won't tell you that you have some failed hires or people that at the end doesn't uh, don't fit, but we had very 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 minimum attrition in terms of people because uh, we invested a lot uh, early on in defining who should be uh, joining the company how the process should be structured and making sure also that there is some kind of peer review before anybody join. So there is like a thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, like team fit, where you can, everybody can give their own opinion, the people that will 
be joining. So very useful to use that as a safeguard to make sure that you, you hire the right people. Okay, that, that's brilliant. I think uh, so many so many founders are talking about the way they integrate people into the culture, but also about the way they hire the people that would integrate better in the first place, right? So they, they are looking for a specific person, for a specific set of skills and, and for a specific set of, I don't know, the vibe, the overall attitude towards work exactly. and everything. So I think, yeah, that's a great strategy. All right. Well, I want to talk about something else, a kind of a turning point for Token, maybe for you personally, you during the expansion of the company, first you expanded to Spain, then it was Netherlands, and then it was the US, right? And you moved to the US for that reason. Yeah. So why was it important for you to be there in order to penetrate the market? Yeah, so being in the US was very important because for the culture, important to understand the market uh, uh, so i decided to move because you know when you want to hire the right people if you want to convince your first clients uh, you need to show that you are really dedicated and committed and you are here and you are part of their country of their culture and that's why i decided to move so for me i consider you can know as a french american company uh, even if the headquarters mm -hmm. is in france me as you I am in the US and very important to to show that we are not just like a French player trying to acquire let's say, companies in different countries, but show that yeah we, we care about our customers, we care about understanding the market, the culture and, and we want to grow sustainably and, and yeah with with conviction in the market. Okay. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just note that I found this article of yours or a blog post, uh, where you're talking about the move and about the way that you've learned about the market and how you decided not to go to external consultants or the agency to help you do that. So I, I think that was, that really reflects what you were saying. You, you wanted to learn about your customers yourself. You moved yourself and well, your family, I guess some of the team members as well there. What do you think is or was important for you in order to understand that new culture, in order to understand how to get into the new market without the use of the agency? And what would be your advice for other founders that, that maybe want to enter new markets and don't know how to do it. So for me, it's direct exposition to sales cycle and to hiring process. And that's for the business, but also for personal life, very important to really fit in uh, the environment, watching local sports, <laughs> hanging out with like, local yeah. friends uh, and, yeah, and talking to customers, understanding their feedback driving the interviews for people who will be joining very important to yeah be on the field very close to prospect customers employees to make sure that you you live with them you understand uh, everything and you uh, you are on the same page right so you mentioned local sports so is it american football or baseball for you <laughs> for me it's more hockey Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was a bit unusual. Maybe I don't know. Oh well, that's. Oh uh, yeah. In, um, in the north, you know, there is a lot of hockey. We... Hockey. Hockey is very popular right, in, in the northeast. I live in, in in Boston. Yeah. Right. For sure. Okay. Since we're talking about the uh, the overall sales industry and uh, also the customers that you're serving since you're in data and business intelligence. So what do you see right now? Uh, what are the trends in data analysis and how companies utilize the data? Yeah, so it's a very broad question, but what we see is that more and more companies need and do that. They, they every incident, every software, every product, every organization need to be analytics enabled. Uh, and this is what we're trying to solve 
focusing on what we call customer facing analytics because we want all B2B organizations to be able to leverage the data they own, they create, they collect to make sure that they uh, build the right analytics offering for their own customers. So we see that it's mandatory, it's a huge trend. As everybody is doing, as more and more people are doing it, it's like a snowball effect because you can be the only one not doing it. So yeah, it, uh, it drives a lot of investment, a lot of, yeah, a lot of projects which will be very fully analytics enabled. Okay, what about AI? AI is entering every other company in SaaS. What about Tuka? Yeah. How are you leveraging yeah, yeah, yeah. it in a way? Sure. I would say so far we uh, we are not leveraging it. Maybe it's a mistake, but uh, as there are, it's a lot, lot, lot of noise that buzz uh, since a, a few years already. We prefer to be very focused on what we do today and partner with the right solution that bring some AI capabilities. We see AI as more like a features rather than a product. Uh, we plan to add okay. more AI in, in the roadmap later in 2024, obviously, for sure. But yeah, we had a pretty packed roadmap this year and last year. So yeah, we didn't want to rush. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you chose to first absorb it and see what others are doing. Just exactly. Uh, Right. Okay. Maybe that's the smartest, <laughs> that's the smartest strategy of all, because yeah, it's just such a buzz. So everyone wants to jump in, uh, but nobody really knows like what to, where to integrate it so that, you know, it's life changing. Okay. Well, excited to see how you're going to do it in uh, 2024 then. All right. And yeah, I, I have a couple more questions for you. Is there any hack? that has been really helpful for you for going from an early stage startup to a scale up maybe for you personally because obviously i i guess your role as a leader has changed over the years maybe you went from more hands-on ceo to a more strategical role um so is there anything that you constantly go back to and something that maybe not so conventional, but works for you? <laughs> That's a very tough question. I would say for me, uh, balance, work, personal and, and work-life balance is very important because you can be burned up uh, in the early years. I didn't have that uh, right balance. And since I have it, I think it makes me much more productive, much more yeah, sharp. So th that that's one thing. In that balance, sports is very important because you need to have like a good health and feel not only in your outer brain that you are doing lots of things, but also in your body. So for me, that that's another uh, very important thing. And and yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's very interesting. I was just at this tech conference and David Hanemeyer Hansen was one of the guests he joined remotely. And that was one of the questions, like what how to navigate how to balance because like a lot of devs out there everyone loves to code everyone loves to just jump into the product and just like code away for weeks and that's exactly what he said like get out do some sports <laughs> be active yeah. that will help you <laughs> just yeah. like simple science yeah simple hack all right right absolutely agree with you all right and so far for you in this journey what has been the biggest win and the biggest failure again maybe for you as a founder or for token yeah so <laughs> biggest biggest win for me is the the team we've built very happy to have scale like a a team of people that are talented committed dedicated and that have like lots of pleasure to work with so for me that's my biggest win the team we've built Biggest failure, the um, some cust uh, customers we lost. <laughs> it's always a failure to see that when you have like a good product with like good usage, good value, and at the end there is some customers that still decide to churn with irrational decisions, uh, and they tell you that's an irrational decision, that's a politic decision, that's yeah for me like a big failure. Okay, all right, that's yeah, that's kind of a, a new 
I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone turn for political reasons, but okay, maybe we will not discuss it here just yet <laughs> on a SaaS podcast. But uh, okay. And what do you feel about this year? Because again, something that came up uh, yesterday during our uh, AMA, the economical situation is not the best. Some founders, well, a lot of founders are impacted. A lot of companies are impacted and a lot of founders were trying to get back to that kind of bootstrapper mindset, become a bit more scrappy, try to retain more customers rather than work on new features, maybe like add AI into the mix and, you know, try to pump up the product. So how do you feel about this year? Is it stabilizing? How was it for you? And what did you do to manage the whole situation? Yeah, so situation will be will be good. Uh, I would say it, it wasn't like a, a smooth journey in the sense that uh, lots of moving parts in the past, I would say at least two years between COVID, Ukraine, financing crisis. So the macroeconomic context is very uh, uh, harsh, I would say. What did we do? So adopting like a very clear uh, tight customer relationship in some sense, very close to our customers, listening very carefully to them, being very proactive in the communication. Yeah, that's very, that was very, very important to retain uh, our customers. Okay. So you are doing something uh, for retention because again, lots of opinions on this podcast. Some say, you know, if they go, they go, you don't have to do anything because you ca- you don't want to be no, no, clingy no. to your, to your no. customers. What do you do? Is there a retention strategy in place? Yeah, so for us, yeah, there is, and we invest uh, heavily thanks to our CSM team. Um, like I say, very proactive uh, quarterly business reviews, any communication around like if there is any incidents, make sure that we have like a very good response rate and, and timing when they have any inquiry. So yeah, so very important to monitor usage, drive more usage, drive, drive more use cases because the more they use, the more they use, the more value they extract and the more sticky we are. So yeah. Okay. All right. Well, what are you, yeah, again, let's get back a little bit to the KPIs. What are you tracking in order to get a hold of your customers and increase your retention? So we are tracking a usage. We are tracking yeah, usage from viewers, builders. We are tracking uh, all the uh, u- usage metrics. We are obviously tracking our cohorts, our retention, gross net retention, and also from a dollar or logo perspective. All right. And you're doing it all with beautiful visualization yeah, by Tukin. Tukin, exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, if anyone in the audience wants to find you or try Token, where do they go? On our website, uh, chickentoko.com, and uh, we'd be very happy to engage with them. And what about what if they want to talk to you about well ah, the product or maybe a possible yeah, partnership so they can, or <laughs> they can e- email me charles at chickentoko.com and. I try to be very responsive and to my email, so yeah, I should be. Answering. All right, thank you, thank you, and thank I, I you hope much, after Anna. this podcast, yeah, after this podcast, you'll get quite a few uh, requests from interested parties. So thank I you for so. your story, Charles. It's been, it's you, been great listening to you, and excited to see what you're going to to do in 2024. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, and take care.